All right, guys. <laughs> this should be a pretty, uh, pretty simple, uh, straight to the chase of things sermon. And I'm going to enjoy this for personal reasons. I'm really going to like this little message here. The name of this message is going to be Hey There, Delala. <laughs> oh, goodness. Before I get very much into of what this message is about, let me say this real quick just to catch you up so you can know uh, once I start this where I'm going so we can just hit the ground running. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I did a couple of sermons, and one of them was called Chivalry's Not Dead, It's Surely Alive. And then the next one was called Maybe She's Born With It, Maybe She's Magdalene. And they kind of kind of went hand in hand because the second one picked up where the first one left off. And the first one, I was talking about how sometimes things that seem to contradict each other, that seem to not go hand in hand, sometimes actually do go hand in hand. Sometimes we have a misunderstanding of things from what we've been told or taught over the years. And then when we really investigate and look into things, we see that there are some things that really just go together great. And they're really not a contradiction after all. Once you get a better understanding, it can go hand in hand. And I talked about that. And then I ended talking a little bit about uh, Mary Magdalene. And so then in that next message, uh, that's what that message was about. It was about feeling like a Mary Magdalene, feeling like maybe you're a little late in the game, uh, feeling like, you know, you got a checkered past, but you're trying to do right now. You're trying to live right. You're trying to go all out for Jesus. And I was just explaining that you shouldn't feel like you're uh, so far behind. Uh, just know that your disadvantage, what you feel is a disadvantage, can be your advantage. So that's what I talked about. And even though it's been a minute since I've done those two, let me just say that this sermon is going to pick up where those left off. However, let me say this. For those of you who uh, you felt like those messages were for you, and maybe you feel like the Mary Magdalene's, let me say this real quick. This message is not for you. This message right here, let me say it again, is not for you, for those of you who are the Mary Magdalene's. This message is for those who are counterfeit versions of you. <laughs> let me say that again. This sermon is about the counterfeit people who are the counterfeit versions of the Mary Magdalene's. In other words, there are people that want to be in your shoes, you Magdalene's. They want to be in your shoes, but they don't want to do right. They're just posing, posing for a price. And this message is for the Delilahs because I've come to realize that's basically what a Delilah is. A Delilah is in, you know, Delilah is in the, the, the woman from the story of Samson and Delilah. Yeah, her. A Delilah is really just a counterfeit version of Mary Magdalene, if you think about it. She's not the real deal. She doesn't have the good intentions that Mary Magdalene does. She has false intentions, but she's trying to walk kind of in the shoes of someone who would be a Mary Magdalene. And I just want to say to some of you Delilahs out there who are about to get exposed, there's something you need to know. You, you're in a position right now where you're trying to figure a Samson out. You're trying to figure him out because you haven't come across another Samson like this before. And you're trying to figure out how to get him or her right where you want them. And you just can't. You can't sink your claws into them. You can't seem to sink your teeth into them to get them right where you want them. And there's a reason for that. That's because this isn't just any other Samson. This is what I call a Samson 
<laughs> Remember back in the day when, when people would get these updates on their computers, they would always call it the 2.0 version, in other words, an upgrade, in other words, now their uh, computer or hard drive has some type of update that gives them this extra information that it needs or this extra protection against the spyware and the computer viruses out there. That's basically what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a Samson who's probably already dealt with a Delilah or two or three or four or more. <laughs> and they've had enough and they've got their wake up call. And now they see things for what it is, right? And so now you're being a Delilah and you're trying to get somebody right where you want them and you're trying to figure out why. It's because you're not dealing with some new, fresh out of the womb uh, Samson. You're dealing with a Samson 2.0 or another name would be a Samson 3000. <laughs> you're dealing with a whole nother level of something. Something that's probably already done figured you out. And that's why it's not quite working. And so I'm here to tell some Delilahs out there, the problem is simply put, you're trying to have the best of both worlds. You're trying to have your cake and eat it too. I've explained before how sometimes things that may contradict seem like they can go together. They actually can, but I'm here to tell you in this sermon, I'm sorry, but this is not one of those moments. This is one of those moments where you can't have both, where it really is a contradiction and it really can't go hand in hand. You really can't ride the fence on this. You can't be both a Delilah and try to be a Mary Magdalene. You really can't do it. It's going to have to be one or the other. What do I mean? Let me explain something. Maybe you go to the store and maybe you, you're the person that buys with cash. Maybe you don't use debit or credit. You go, you use cash and you pay for something. And the cashier, she might take that dollar. He might take that dollar bill. But if you hand them a 100, they might take it and hold it up and, and hold it to the light and look at it real hard. What are they doing? They're seeing if it's the real deal or they're seeing if it's a counterfeit. They're seeing if it's a real $100 bill or they're trying to see if it's something that's made to look like the real deal. But when you really look at it for what it is and hold it up to the light and really investigate it, you see that it is just a poser. It just wants you to think that it's the real deal. That's kind of like, it's almost like that cashier is being almost like a Samson 2.0. It's like, no, let, let me look at this for a second. Let me check this out and see if this is legit before I accept this. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on. You're a Delilah and this is what you think. And I'm going to get into scripture here in a moment so we can look into this Delilah. You know, this is what you're doing. Maybe you've been uh, a type of woman who maybe you've been very beautiful. Maybe you've had a nice body or, or a beautiful face. And maybe as time has gone by over the years, Maybe that's how you've gotten by. Maybe you've gotten by with your looks or your charms. And so maybe, <laughs> I'm going to call them lucky charms. You've gotten by on your lucky charms. <laughs> but but you, you've gotten by with this for so long. And maybe you've been the type of person, it's almost like you're a little female player, if you will. Maybe you can just go and get any guy or girl that you want. You get any guy and you know ahead of time that they're probably not going to turn you down because uh, it would be silly of them not to because you're such a pretty girl and they could have you on their arm and they can brag about you and show you off. And so you can, you, you can almost guarantee they're going to say, yeah, and y'all can go and hang out and, 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 and look good together and take some pictures to post on Facebook. And you can go along with that just to make them feel good. But really, you're just in it for the attention. You could care less. You're probably not anywhere near in love with this person. You're just getting attention and you can 
go from God to God, from person to person. Whenever you get ready, whenever your little feelings get hurt about something, you can just get with some other guy just so you can have instant attention, an instant yes from somebody when somebody else may have told you no about something. So you get that instant yes, you 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 bat them eyes and you give that grin and you get an instant yes. So you hear all these yeses and you feel all good about yourself. And you're thinking, I got hoes, I got hoes. You know, <laughs> you, you're walking around thinking you can just get anybody you want. All you got to do is just, just put on that charm. And it's worked and it's worked and it's worked and you've gotten by, getting, gotten away with so much stuff because of it. But then you come across somebody, you come across that Samson, and maybe you think, well, maybe I've tore down a Samson before. This, this, this might work. They might not be as strong as they think they are. And, and, and you try to spend some time trying to, to really get into the emotions or the feelings of that Samson. And, and maybe they'll talk to you. Maybe they'll say hi. They might have conversation with you, but no matter how much you bat them eyelashes and give that pearly white grin and, and do all this and flip that long pretty hair around and, and every time you do all that you can to, to flirt and get some extra attention, there's something about it. It seems like it just doesn't work. It seems like it just doesn't have that effect on this particular Samson. It seems like it just isn't working out for you. And you keep trying and trying, but it's almost like there's some invisible barrier that keeps them from just wanting to touch you. And you can't quite figure out why. You can't quite figure out what it is. And you realize that the more you pay attention to them, the more you're drawn to this Samson, this Samson 2.0. You see that they're strong because they have this this dependence about them to where they don't feel like they need the thumbs up from everybody. They love themselves enough to not let themselves be treated any kind of way. They're the type of person that you can see that they have a little bit of confidence, that they don't look for everyone to give them attention. They don't look for everyone to like every Facebook status. There's somebody that no matter what, they're going to stand their ground and they're going to continue to be who they are. They're not going to let somebody change them. They're not trying to blend in or fit in. They don't mind sticking out and being different. But at the same time, there's not this arrogance about them either. It's not that they're arrogant. It's not that they think they're all that. It's just simply put that they are strong in themselves. They love themselves enough and have enough respect for themselves to just be them, to do their own thing. And they have the mindset of, if you like me, awesome. And if you don't, that's okay. I'm not going to sell out and sell myself short to try to make everyone like me. And so you're drawn to that, Delilah. You're drawn to that strength that they seem to have, that, that strength of, I don't care if I'm accepted by everybody. I'm still going to be different. I'm still going to do me. And you're just drawn to it. But the problem is you don't want to fully be drawn like that. You don't want somebody that can tap into your heart and into your emotions because you uh, reject uh, or sorry, you fear rejection. You fear what if they say no? What if they ever push me away? So instead of letting yourself continue to be drawn, you want to try to reel them in. So you work double time. You work extra time trying to, to pull in this Samson 2.0 to get your claws into them, to sink your teeth into them. But it still seems to not work. It still seems no matter how much you pursue, it just seems like it's not quite working. And there's a reason for it. It's probably because they've dealt with some Delilahs like you before. And maybe they've learned the hard way that what they need is not a Delilah. They need a Mary Magdalene. They need somebody who's, who can come in and really be a good friend or a good uh, partner 
someone to possibly marry, but they need someone on their side who's really for them, who really truly loves them and wants to open up to them and wants to care for and about them. Not somebody that's coming in just trying to just get a yes to make themselves feel good, to boost themselves up, to be able to say, look at what I've done. I've tamed this lion. I've tamed this Samson. And now I get to parade it around. And when I get ready and I get in there feeling good enough, I can whip them and tear them down. Down, and then I can move on to someone else when that Samson isn't viewed as a Samson anymore. When I've afflicted that Samson to the point where they're not so strong anymore in the people's eyes. And then I can move on to somebody else. See, that's not what the Samson 2.0 needs. And it's not what they want either. If you want this Samson 2.0, you've got to be a Mary Magdalene. Or you're going to have to go on back to staying on that side of the fence and being a Delilah. You cannot ride the fence on this. But there's one more thing that you could possibly be up to. Maybe it's not just that you're trying to get this Samson to boost your ego and your self-esteem and to get that easy yes that you just love to get because it makes you feel so good, makes you feel like a somebody. There could be one more thing. There could be what we're going to call a Philistine somewhere in the background. Somewhere that that when you take a few steps back and you lean back, they come up behind you and they get in your ear. And they tell you about how they're going to give you something if you go and you tame this Samson and you get this Samson to to reveal his secrets to you and to reveal where his strength lies and to reveal what his weakness is. And if you can just get this information and you can cause some trouble for that Samson, if you can cause him to be weak, if you can cause him to to tell him your whole heart, and you can cause trouble and make this Samson look bad. You can bag back up and lean your head back into the shadows where we can't see what's going on. And then that, that Philistine will come up to you, get back in your ear and say, oh, you've done the task. Well, let me give you the cash. You've done what I've said. Now I'm going to reward you for taming this Samson. So now that I've got the information that I need, now that we've wore this Samson out, now that he is afflicted, now that his strength is gone now that we have information that we can hold over his head to keep him in check so that we can ride this line out and ride the coattails of this lion now that you've done this here's your reward do as you will now maybe you've got a philistine who's using you or wanting to use you to spy this samson out and you're thinking This is like double the reward. I get a reward from the Philistine, but I get my own personal reward if I get that easy yes that I love to get so much. And that's where I want to look into scripture. Let's look at this. Go with me to Judges chapter 16. I'll give you a moment to get there. Judges chapter 16, look with me at verses 4 and 5. It says, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lies, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So what's happened here is this. You have Samson and you have uh, this guy, and he's just regular Samson here. This ain't the Samson 2.0 I've been talking about. (laughs) But you have this Samson here, 
And, and, and let me tell you about Samson real quick. He's kind of like a type and shadow of Jesus. I've told you guys before about types and shadows. Sometimes things will play out in the New Testament to, to set as an example for the things to come in the, in, in the New. Things will play out in the Old Testament to, to show what's going to happen in the New. And so, for example, you had Moses. And Moses was a guy that God chose to set his people, the Israelites, free from the bondages of Egypt. Now, even though this is a real thing and it's real people and it's really happening, the story is used to, to, to be an example of something else. Because uh, Moses is viewed kind of like a Old Testament version of Jesus. Here's why. Because Egypt, the Egyptian people who had the Israelites in slavery and bondage, they are a representation of sin. Egypt would equal sin because just like how they had those people, God's people bound up, that's also what sin does. It keeps people in bondage and, and in slavery and keeps them bogged down and keeps them out of the promised land that God has for them. So, so. Uh, Moses is used to set the people fr free from Egypt, but symbolically he's being used to set the people free from their sins. You get it? Kind of like what Jesus does. So Moses is kind of like a little uh, type and shadow or a foreshadowing of what's going to come in the New Testament with Jesus. And then you have David. Little David, before he became king after Saul, you had David who, who uh, he, he was the one that came on the scene. And when the Philistines and God's people were kind of going at it, and then Goliath, this giant, comes out of nowhere, and he's on the side of the Philistines, and he's out there taunting the people of God. You had David that came on the scene, and he took a stone, and through it, and it wasn't that he was going by his own strength to, t to try to tear down Goliath. He was stepping out on faith, and he used something simple to bring him down, kind of like how Jesus said that if you simply have faith the size of a small grain of mustard seed, you can make a giant mountain move. And that's what David did. He used something as small as this stone, and with his faith, he threw it, believing that he could tear down that giant that is Goliath. And so he did that. But also, how it's a type and shadow of Jesus is how the Philistines, in a way, represent demonic forces, if you will powers uh, evil powers and then you have goliath who is like the leader of them so he's like the ultimate demon he's the devil himself so goliath and the philistines are kind of like the devil and all his demon buddies coming up against god's people so here's david fighting against the powers of darkness so again there's another one but here we have samson and samson is another example of someone who could be like a type and shadow of Jesus because if you notice a lot of times when we try to depict Jesus in, in pictures and in movies and stuff, we have some guy with long hair and he's called Jesus of Nazareth. Well, Samson is a guy who is also a Nazarite and he has long hair, long locks of hair and in scripture it even said that when his mother, when she had became pregnant with him, she was told that a razor should never touch his head. In other words, his hair should never be cut off. It should just continue to grow long because there was like this anointing that God had given him to where his strength and his power would be in his hair. So the more and the longer, the more powerful he would be. So one of his things was he would fight off the Philistines, fight off the enemy to help protect God's people. And so, because of his strength, because of his might, the Philistines really want a way to take him out, but they don't know how. How do you fight this guy who's kind of like a Hercules? How do you tear down this guy who's causing so much trouble for them to be able to 
to advance against the people of God? That's the question. So they see that Samson has a thing for Delilah. And so some Philistines go to Delilah and say, okay, we see he has a thing for you. We see he's in love with you. We need to use this to our advantage. We want you to find out all you can. Find out where his strength lies. Because it hadn't been told to people at this point that the hair is where his strength lies. They're like, find out where his strength lies. Find out his weakness. Find out how he can be taken down. Question him. Because since he likes you, he'll probably uh, confide in you and tell you his business. And then when you let us know, we'll pay you this all this silver 1100 in silver will give you something to help you prosper if you give us what we want to help us prosper and advance against the people of God and so we know how the story plays out Delilah spends time with Samson he or sorry she questions him daily questioning him what is the strength of your power? How can you be taken down? How can you be taken out? And you would think that if she cared anything about him, she wouldn't be doing that. But she keeps questioning him. And one of the things I never understood was why in the world, Samson, would you do it? Why would you continue to let someone question you to try to bring you down, to try to get information about you, to bring you down and to wear you out and to afflict you and to cause you problems. Why would you be, be so infatuated with somebody that you know is really no good for you and who really does not mean you well? But then I began to realize maybe, maybe as crazy as it seems, it's not that Samson doesn't understand what's going on. It's not that Samson doesn't realize that Delilah is no good for him. Maybe he's just lonely. Maybe him being this strong, powerful dude, this guy that can take on many at once all by himself, maybe after doing this for so long, it has caused some people to be jealous of him. And, and, and maybe he spent time being suspicious of others, thinking maybe they just can't be my real friend because it seems like they, they're just jealous and they're just trying to start trouble. Or maybe he's come across some people that, that are suspicious of him. He's not suspicious of them. They're suspicious of him because maybe they're thinking, if this guy's so strong, what if he decides to turn his back on us? What if he tries to hurt us so we need to stay away from him because if something were to happen, if he were to get mad at us and blow up on us, we wouldn't stand a chance, so let's stay away. So there are people that probably wouldn't want to have anything to do with him out of being suspicious. And maybe he's had people who have thought, hey, if we can take this guy down, we can get something out of this. We can get some money. So maybe he's had people that have tried to come up against him before. Or maybe simply put, he's tried to sit down and just be normal and have normal conversation with people and have normal friendships with people. And, and, and maybe it's been hard for him because there are people that probably don't understand the calling on his life. There are people that don't understand him and who he is and what he's about and why he has to do what he has to do. Maybe when he tries to talk to people, they can't relate. They can't understand his scenario. And so because of all these different possible factors, maybe Samson is just alone. Maybe he wants somebody he can vent to, somebody he can trust. And so maybe, maybe even though he sees some signs that Delilah means him no well, maybe, maybe he's just giving up. Maybe he's just ignoring the warning signs just to finally have a chance to be able to sit down and talk to a pretty girl that will listen to his problems and his struggles. Maybe... Maybe it's just a moment for him to unwind, even if he knows that the end result could be bad. Maybe he was physically strong. Maybe 
he was just mentally weak at the moment. He might have been physically strong, but maybe up here in his mind, he was just tired, and he wanted to rest his mind and just say what was on his mind and what was on his heart. And so in the story, Delilah constantly presses him for information. And at first we see Samson make up stuff, make up ways that he could be taken out, make up false uh, ways that, that his strength can be taken from him. And every time he tells one of these little lies, Delilah tries it out. She tries out all these different scenarios to see what will work. And every time she's like, you lied to me. That didn't work. Seriously now, tell me the truth. What is really going to take you out and take you down? And then when we look here at verse 15, it says this. And she said unto him, how canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lies. So now Delilah is saying, you know, if you really love me, you tell me the truth. How can you say you love me if you won't tell me where your strength lies? So she's been a bit manipulative. And it's funny because, as I said earlier, if she really loved him, she wouldn't be trying to put him in this position that she's trying to put him in. But it didn't say that she loved him. It just says that he loved her. Mm, that says a lot all by itself right there. Verse 16. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. And if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once. For he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hands. And she made him sleep upon his knees. And she called for a man. And she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him. And his strength went from him. So she finally got him right where she wanted him. She kept trying and trying and trying, and finally she got the information she needed. <laughs> she got him to sleep with his head in her lap, and she called some people to come and cut his hair, and she afflicted him and caused him trouble and caused the strength to leave from him. And he was finally able to be accessible for the Philistines to come in and capture him. And she got her money. She got the easy yes. She got the information she needed to get the prize that she was offered. And she went away feeling some type of way, feeling all that, feeling like the Delilah, the no good Delilah that she is getting all her yeses and all her prizes. But I'm here to speak, some, to speak to some Delilahs right now and simply say, whoever this is for, you're trying to deal with some Samson 2.0s. And if you think that by simply asking some questions, the same questions daily to get into somebody's business is going to work, let me tell you, it's going to take more than that. It's going to take more than a few cute smiles. It's going to take more than a few pictures, a few selfies of you on Facebook. It's going to take a little bit more than you trying to dress pretty and trying to bat them eyes and get some type of reaction. It's going to take a little bit more work than that. It's not going to work for you if you're a Delilah. 
because what that Samson 2.0 needs, as I've said, is a Mary Magdalene, someone who really, truly cares. And that's what we're going to look at real quick. Go with me to Luke, and I want to look at something just really fast. It won't take but a moment. Luke chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. I've read this in one of those uh, two sermons I was telling you about earlier, but I just want to read it real quick again. It says, And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Philist or sorry, in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And I've said before that these two verses uh, here, it's believed that this woman is in fact, Mary Magdalene. And so, we see her using her hair to wipe off Jesus's feet. We see a couple of things here in comparison to Delilah. One of the things is Delilah was going to get money. She was going to get this reward for taking out a type and shadow of Jesus, this Samson. But here we see Mary take this alabaster box, something that is worth a lot, could be worth some silver, a lot of silver, but instead she destroys it. She breaks it open to be able to use the things in it to assist Jesus. So we have Delilah who's out to get a prize, to get money, to get whatever she can to do what she does best, which is seduce but we have Mary who is willing to give up some things to not try to get glory or get a prize out of assisting Jesus but doing it from her heart see Delilah had said to Samson how can you say you love me how can your heart be with me if you don't give me the information I want, she was trying to get into his heart and get into his motions and into his feelings. She was trying to get that good soul tie in to get him right where she wanted him. But instead of Mary Magdalene trying to take Jesus's heart just so she can crush it and run over it back and forth as many times as she wants. It's like she's just trying to give her heart over, give her heart over to him to help him out. But another thing we see that, that really gives it away is the fact that Delilah would have people. She, she had Samson, Samson fall asleep with his head on her lap so she could have access to that hair on his head and she called some people in, called the enemy in to come and cut off Samson's hair, to take his hair from him. But you have Mary who uses her own hair to wipe the feet of Jesus, the lowest part of him, the part of him that could have been the most dirty. She used that to clean him, to help him, to assist him. She wasn't trying to take from him. She was giving to him. In other words, she's so opposite of Delilah simply because her heart is in the right place. Because she's genuine and because she's real. She's realistic. She's not pretending to be somebody. She's not She's moved from her past to be a better her. She's being a better her, but she's not pretending to be somebody she's not to try to take advantage of Jesus. She's trying to really help. She's trying to show she really cares versus the Delilah who really could care less. Mm. And that's your problem, whoever this is for. That's why it's not going to work. Go with me to the last area I want to take you to. And it is in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. 
And while you're going there, let me share something with you. I want to share this. <laughs> I, I know what it's like to kind of be in a Samson's shoes because I've had to go through some experiences myself to be kind of like a Samson 2.0 in a way. And what I mean is I've had my fair share of Delilah's in life. And I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus or get a pity party because I'll be flat out honest with you. It was my fault. Kind of like, no offense to Samson in the Bible, but what happened to him was his fault because he knew. He knew that she meant him no good, but, she, but he still went along with it anyway. And there were people in the past that I knew were no good, but I still went along with it anyway, even though there were warning signs. Let me say this years ago, and, and again, I, I've changed. I had to grow up. As y'all know, I've told y'all before, you know, waiting for, for, for the right one, waiting for uh, God to just uh, set me up to where I can marry the one that he has for me. But this was years ago. The story I'm telling you now, this was years ago. And I, I wasn't seeking the one. I was just trying to get with someone, <laughs> you know. And uh, I was a bit silly, a bit childish. I was still immature. I was still in my state of mind of if, if I were with somebody who was hot, <laughs> somebody with a pretty face, it wouldn't really matter their attitude because... I could have something I could brag about. And there was a particular woman who sought after me. And I remember this. I still remember it like it was yesterday. She, uh, <laughs> she had started talking to me because I think she had found me on like a dating site or something that I was on at the time. Either that or she, she had knew me through somebody or something. But she, uh, she had started contacting me, and we, she was saying that we would need to hang out sometime. And then I remember bright and early one morning, she texted me and was saying she wanted to hang out. And since I was used to staying up late and then going to sleep, you know, any other person that texted me and wanted to hang out, I probably would have been like, no way, you know, I'm tired, I've been up all night, now it's early morning, sun coming out, why would I want to, you know, go hang out right now, I need my sleep. But I was like, yeah, sure. And so I remember she was saying, well, you know, I've been drinking. <laughs> And that was my warning sign to just go ahead and say, no, no, stay home. But she said, no, I've been up all night because I've been at the club, <laughs> which was another warning sign, but, you know, I just ignored it. And so she was trying to figure out where I stayed because she had already been on the road trying to figure out where I stayed. So I was like, okay, hold on, let me come outside. And so I met her on some street somewhere, wherever she was at. And she took me to her house. And when I get there and we go in the front door, there's people in the living room and more people coming in. And they're talking, being loud. They had been out at the club too drinking. And I remember she took me out of the living room to the back to where her bedroom was. And she shut the door. And she's just showing me around and, you know, there's this other door where you can see the bathroom and then this other door that can take you here and there or wherever. So she's just taking me kind of on, on a tour. And she's like, oh, here's this, here's that, blah, blah, blah. And she's just telling me a little about herself. And so then she's, after all that drinking, she's just ready to pass out. And we're laying down on her bed, and we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything sexual or anything, but we were just laying there, and I was just holding her. And she was just talking. 
running off with the mouth, babbling, saying whatever. <laughs> and we just fell asleep. And it was kind of strange to me that she would just want to pass out with me right there, even though it seemed like she had a living room full of company. Why not just tend to the company, you know? Or why not tell them to leave? Why let them stay there and be there for hours on end and you not entertain your company? But I didn't ask. I didn't want to be nosy. I just figured it's her business. So, you know, anyway, the next day, or well, the same day, really it's, just, it's the same day because it's not like I went there at night. So later on that day, halfway during the day, I get up and I leave. And... Eventually, I ended up finding out something. Well, let me say this first. As time goes by, I've kind of getting to know her. I keep seeing the signs that this isn't someone I need to try to have a relationship with because she has a drinking problem. And it's not just that she has this problem. It's the fact that she does not want to get rid of the problem. She knows that it's caused her trouble. She admits of how all this drinking has caused her trouble in her life. But anytime I will suggest anything about possibly getting some help, oh, no, 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 no. Just all these excuses for not getting the help or usually just a change of subject, just changing the subject to talk about somebody else or to talk about something else, rather. And so she, I noticed her wishy-washiness. One moment she's wanting to... Maybe talk to this person or get back with an ex or this or that. And it seemed like I was kind of her fallback. It seemed like I was the one where when things wouldn't work out with somebody she wanted to date, then she wanted to call or text me and then hang out. And so I remember this one time I thought I really was going to have a chance possibly. And I wanted to show her that I cared. And she had kids. So this is what I did. I had some money saved up. And at the job I work at, you know, we, <clears throat> every few months we can get a bonus. And this was around Christmas time. It was around the holidays. It was coming up. And so it was, the bonus was quite a bit bigger than usual. So with the money that I already had and with the bonus that I had, I figured, hey, this is enough to live off of. So when I had gotten my check, my actual paycheck by itself, I pretty much gave her the whole check, that whole paycheck, just so she could have money to keep the bills paid and to get the kids something for Christmas because the one that she was with had walked out on her. That same night that I ended up giving her this money, guess what? Her and her last ex end up getting right back together. And eventually she ends up moving right back in. <laughs> she lets the ex move right back in. So I'm thinking, did I just get played here? She's got the sob story about not being able to get the bills paid and this and that because her ex just left her. And then after I do that, then she lets her ex move right back in. It just, it was crazy. So I looked kind of like an idiot, but I couldn't be mad at anybody because it was my own fault because I saw all the warning signs. But this is what I ended up finding out. One day a friend of mine's like, hey, let's go hang out with this, this other buddy of mine. I want you all to meet this other buddy of mine. So we go and we're hanging out at this place where his buddy is and I recognized uh, his buddy. <laughs> and the, his buddy's like, hey, you, you know me, you remember me, right? And I was looking at him, I was like, yeah, I know you, where I know you from. And he's like, remember, I was one of those people that was at blah blah blah's house that night and he was mentioning th this girl that i'm telling you about this this delilah right and i'm like yeah i remember you there now this guy he's one of those people that was in the living room that day you remember i said all them people that were coming 
and they had all been at the club too out drinking you know they were all in the living room but th this Delilah took me in into the back and I'm trying to figure out why she's not entertaining company but she's not making them leave either they're just staying there well he goes on to tell me <laughs> what happened at the club he's saying that him and this girl the one I'm calling Delilah he said she had been drinking and she was just talking trash and bragging about herself and talking about how good looking she was and talking about how she could get anybody she wanted to and so after talking all this trash she had made this bet and she was talking about how watch this right now I can get on my phone and I can text somebody and I can have once we get out of this club I can have somebody at my house right right now if I want to I'll prove it to y'all so really when she texted me early that morning and wanted me to come over that's the reason why she took me to the back that's the reason why she had company there but wasn't entertaining them she was trying to show off she was really using me so she could show off to everybody else see I told you if once we got out of this club I can just go and text somebody and just have them be at my house and take them to my bedroom right now if I want to so that's what I get for being immature that's what I get for knowing what the deal is but ignoring the warning signs because at the time I was just being a Samson I hadn't quite learned yet and when you learn and you get that 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 better understanding like when they say you know better you do better it's like downloading this this necessary software you just get this software and and you become a 2.0 version of yourself because you know better and you got this special understanding this special wisdom called software where now it just blocks all this spyware and all these viruses get it spyware spying spying somebody out being used to get information about somebody or being used to take advantage of somebody and and viruses get it making you sick i'm blocking off all these viruses and spywares now because i've upgraded to a samson 2.0 <laughs> I've learned since then is my point. I've grew up just a little bit since then. So if I start seeing the signs that maybe, maybe this person is just using me. Maybe this person just isn't going to be serious about me. They're just toying with me. They're just getting some gain out of this so they can be able to say, oh, I tamed this lion. That's that's a sign to me that maybe I need to back up just a little bit <laughs> I want you to listen to this and then I'm gonna go over my last two verses and I'm gonna wrap this up I recently had a dream about this same woman this Delilah that I'm telling you about I recently had a dream now like I said what happened in this story I just told you it happened years ago but this dream is recent and it's almost like God kind of took me back in time to let me see how things would have played out if I had actually tried to make a relationship work with her and I had actually moved in with her and I actually tried to be good to her and support her and this and that and in this dream I'm there I'm in her home because well I've moved in and she's all over the floor because she's been drinking and she's just all over the floor just uh, uh, just holding her face and acting like she just can't get up because she's so dizzy from drinking she just can't control herself she's just trying to you know stay awake and stay alert and she's just rolling all over the floor and I'm standing up and I'm looking down at her like get up come on get up and so all of a sudden there's people coming into her house or our house rather because like I said I moved in but there's people move or coming into the house just coming in doing what they want to do taking stuff just leaving leaving her house with stuff and I'm seeing this 
Now, none of this is my stuff. I'm just there, you know what I mean, in, in her place, but this is her stuff. So I'm, I'm like, hey, you know, trying to get her up. Look, look at what's going on. Look, they're taking your stuff. Get up, get up. Look, 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 look. They're taking stuff. Get up, get up, get up. She's still just, uh, just on the floor. And all of a sudden, it was just like I felt something. It was like something had left me. And I reached down into my pocket and I pulled out my phone and I had gotten a text. And I have this thing, it's funny, how sometimes God will use stuff, sim symbols, but he'll use stuff that you really are familiar with in dreams sometimes too to help make a point. I have this thing on my phone where I can text this certain, text to the certain number and it'll tell me what the, the balance is on my debit card, how much money that I have, right? So I pull out my phone in, in the dream. I pull out my phone and I look and I got a text message and, and, and they, don't, they don't send me a text. I have to text them first and they send a text to me telling me how much I have on my account. But in the dream, I pull out my phone out of my pocket and they just, without me texting them, this company, they just go ahead and send me a text telling me how much money I have. And out of all my life savings, all I had was like $3 and something cents left. <laughs> so I had went from having like 300 and something dollars saved up to having like $3 and like 74 cents or so something like that. Just out of nowhere, it just suddenly disappeared from my account. And it was like I felt it. Like I felt like something had f disappeared from me. And all of a sudden, I pull out the phone, and I get a text saying, hey, you know, basically saying, hey, you're broke. You know, <laughs> somebody took all your money at the snap of a finger. And so now I'm really trying to wake her up or, or get her up off the floor. I'm like, look, look, and I'm showing her my phone. I'm like, look, 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 this is what has happened. Now I'm being stolen from, too. You got to get up. You got to stop this. And she's just mm, mm, all over the floor. <laughs> all over the floor and I was basically being shown that that's what would have happened she she would have just kept losing stuff like what she's been doing she would have still had people in and out of her house taking stuff from her and taking advantage of her and then in the process of that I would have had to basically watch it happen because she won't get the help that she needs to stop it. But also, I would start losing stuff too. Stuff of mine, the little that I had would have start vanishing and I wouldn't have been able to stop it because I wouldn't even be able to see who's taking it. Like I said, I couldn't even see anybody come near me, but somehow they were able to take from me. Let me, let me show you this in scripture here. Matthew chapter 12. I'm just thankful that God gave me the wake up call when he did. I'm glad that he's helped me wake up and I'm glad I didn't end up in that situation that I very easily could have been in. I'm glad. And I just find it so funny how as I've been getting ready to do this message, it's like he allowed me to have that dream because it's like what I saw ties into this message. I wasn't even going to talk about this particular girl uh, in this sermon until I had that dream, and then I realized, oh, my goodness, I, I should share that because what he God has shown me ties into this message. So I just find it funny how sometimes, like I've said before, sometimes things will play out in my life that has to do with a message that I'm already preparing for. It's like God will allow things to happen, or in this case, allow me to have a dream that I really could have had years ago. He could have given me that dream during the time, I, you know what I mean? During the time I was trying to talk to this girl, you know what I mean? But instead, years later, he's like, hey, look at this. This is what could have happened. This is what I saved you from. By the way, this ties in to your sermon. Talk about it, <laughs> you know, but anyway, but anyway, let me get to these last couple of verses. Matthew 29 and 23, 29 says, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil 
his house. Hmm. Jesus speaking here and saying, you know, if you were to go into a strong man's house, the only way you're going to be able to, to, to take all of everything from him and completely rob him is if you found a way to bind them up, if you found a way to keep them tied down, like we see on TV when somebody breaks into somebody's house and they might sit them in a chair and tie their hands up with rope behind them and put something, you know, around their face, uh, something that covers their mouth up so that way if they yell, people outside the house can't hear any yelling or screaming or, or they might lay the person down and hog tie them, you know, just have their arms behind them and their feet up behind them and they've got their wrists tied and their ankles tied together, but they have to do something to bind him up to be able to get everything because if he's too strong, he might be able to fight you off. <laughs> and it's funny because as I had been getting my notes ready for this sermon, I was just going to read from verse 30 just read verse 30 and then when I was getting ready for this sermon at the end I backed up and then I saw that verse and I was like wow this this ties into it I'm going to read this too because that's basically what was happening in the dream as I said before how people Philistines can can represent the enemy even though there wasn't a person necessarily holding her down, keeping her on the floor in this dream, that bondage, that sin was keeping her out of it, keeping her from seeing the big picture, keeping her from seeing what's really going on in reality, in the real world, keeping her from seeing what's going on around her. So you have the Philistines coming in and taking. You've got Egypt or sin or bondage that's got her on the floor. Get it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, now you get it. So she's not, she's not strong. Then again, she doesn't want the help, but she's not strong to get up off the floor. And I could do something. Could have did something, but, well, I was a Samson, a Samson that had allowed myself to be afflicted, and I allowed myself to let the claws of Delilah sink in, and that took my strength. So while the enemy has got her down, she has got me down on the inside. I'm standing up in the dream, but I'm left powerless because she's taken my strength because I've allowed it like Samson. But then the Philistines and the Egyptians have come in and then they've taken her strength and my strength that she took from me. So I can't fight them. She can't. But in a way, she really doesn't even want to fight back. She doesn't want the help. <sighs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Finally, verse 30, it says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Let me say this, and I'll wrap this up. <laughs> for those of you who are being Delilah's right now and you're coming across these Samson's and these Samson 2.0's let me say something to you Jesus was saying that either you're for him or you're against him either you're on, your, on his side or you're not and that's basically how it is with these Samson's these people that you know mean well and are good people, but you're just trying to take advantage of them for your own sake, for your own benefit, for your own gain. Either you're really for them or you're against them. If you're going to be for them, you've got to be a Mary Magdalene. 
But if you remain a Delala, you're automatically against them. Sure, you can pretend that you love them and pretend that you care about them. But if you remain a Delala, the truth is, and it always will be, that you're against them. Because as I said in this sermon, this sermon is about how sometimes things really can't go together. Some things really do contradict. You cannot be for a Samson and be a Delala. If you're a Delala, you're automatically against that Samson. It doesn't matter if you've got Samson in your bed or you're in his, you are still against him. Either you're for him or you're against him. There's not going to be an in-between. And if you really want to be for him, you've got to be a Mary Magdalene. You've got to be, in other words, you've got to be selfless, not selfish. You can't be full of yourself and try to help somebody and dedicate uh, some of your time to somebody and really tend to them and minister to them and their needs and, and still try to be a Delilah and tear them down at the same time. It doesn't work. So if you think you really do for once in your life really love and really care about somebody and you really, really, really want something going on with this Samson, the only way it's going to work with this Samson 2.0 is if you become a Mary Magdalene. You cannot be a Delilah. You can't be spying them out. You can't be ready to turn your back on Samson at any moment. You can't be trying to get some benefit from somebody else in the process. You can't do it. You can't ride the fence. You can't be over here with him one moment and over here with the Philistines the next. You can't be with Samson or Jesus over here with, at one moment and over here with Egypt at the next. It's not going to work. So you must choose. You cannot have both it's not gonna work this time i'm sorry baby girl it ain't gonna work you have to accept that now let me say this as well there are people out there that are looking for someone to turn into a delilah and I'm about to let a little secret out of the bag. Sometimes you will hear guys say this right here. You will hear guys say, if I'm going to go after a girl, I want a girl with quote unquote daddy issues. And what they mean is this. They mean that they either want a girl that grew up without her father or she had her father around, but the father was abusive to her, whether sexually abusive or verbally abusive or physically abusive to her. Or she had her father around, but the father was very distant, didn't want to have nothing to do with her, didn't want to spend time with her. Or maybe she saw uh, her, her father do uh, drugs and alcohol, and so he just wasn't around half the time, and when he was around, he was mean, whatever. But something like that. They're saying that a girl like that has, quote, unquote, daddy issues, daddy problems. And so a lot of times when you have guys that are no good, when you have a guy that just, they, they want a girl just to use her or take advantage of her, that's what they say. You'll hear them say, get a girl with daddy issues. And here's why. They believe that if you get a girl like that who grew up like that, she's easier to take advantage of because she is desperate for attention. Automatically, psychologically, she is more desperate to be uh, to want attention, male attention, because she didn't grow up with it. And, and it's easier to use her and take advantage of a girl like that than it would be to take advantage of a girl who grew up having her father around and having a great relationship with her father and still having her father around today and still having a great relationship with him today. 
Because if she has that, she has the male attention she needs. So if she gets with a guy, it's going to be because she thinks that he's going to be a good guy and he's going to treat her right just like how her father treated her right. But if you get somebody that had the daddy issues, as they say, it's going to be much easier to take advantage of her. That's what is believed by many. So if you do fit the category of somebody who might have had daddy issues, you got to understand there will be people who will view you as someone who's easy to take advantage of because you will be desperate for some type of male attention. And a lot of times people will try to also view you as someone who is easy to turn into a Delilah. So in other words, they think, that if they're a guy and they show you some attention and give you some time or give you something, it'll be easier to talk you into going and causing trouble with a Samson. It's easy for them to be a Philistine in your life and use you for their agenda because all they've got to do is show you some special attention. So for you Delilahs, I want you to pay very close attention and I want you to think about what I'm saying. Are you someone who's had daddy issues? Because if so, that could be a big reason why people want to target you and use you as a Delilah because they already know stuff about you. And they want to use stuff against you, kind of like how they're trying to use you to find out stuff about that Samson so they can use that against that Samson. It's just people who want to use people to use people to use people. That's all that it is. So I want you to think about that because you may have people in your life that are giving you special attention right now. And you think they really love you and you think they really care. But in reality, just like how you are being used to be a manipulator and not really care about folks, they're being users and they're manipulating you. And they view you as an easy target. They view you as some easy piece of meat who who will do anything for attention and time and affection. You need to think about that. The next time it seems like people love to to come after you to get that job done of being a Delilah, it's not necessarily because you're so good at it. It's because they don't think much of you. That's why they're doing it. They don't think much of you. They view you as an easy target. They view you as a girl who's sensitive and who wants male attention and male affection so bad that you can be used to go and whore yourself out to any and everybody. Spread your legs for any and everybody. Get in, get into somebody's little uh, affections and emotions. Get, get them to open up to you. Give them a lending ear so that you can come back and bring information to the Philistines. That's why they're using you. Not because you do such a great job at that or anything else for that matter. They just use you as someone who can easily be made into a little whore to do their dirty work. That's it. And because you've allowed this to happen for so long, now you find yourself in a position where you're wanting to be used by people more and more. And that's why. So I hate to break it to you, but these people pursuing you and offering you these things for your time to go and take advantage of folks, it's not a compliment. They might say complimenting words, but that's to get you to be happy and go along with it. But that's not why they're doing it. The truth is they really don't think much of you. And it's time for you to wake up and smell the coffee. It's time for you to wake up and realize that this is not something done out of love. Even if they do say they love you, this is not out of love. Just like when you try to be a Delilah and you try to tell a Samson, if you really love me, you'll tell me all your heart. Well, That's what they're doing to you. They're saying, well, if you really care about me, you'll do this for me. But really, they're just using you to get you to use somebody else. That's it. This is a wake-up call for the Delilahs. This is the reality of why people use you the way they do. It's not because they care. 
Just like when you go after that Samson, it's, you're not doing it for caring and loving somebody. It's all with bad intentions. So if you, and it can be a different scenario for, for many of you out there. It just depends on your scenario. You could be somebody who you might have friends, and your friends, uh, you might have somebody that says, hey, if you want to continue to be a part of this friendship, a part of this circle, we're going to need you to go and take advantage of that good person over there uh, for our benefit, for our gain, even though they haven't done anything wrong. And we're the bad guy and they're the good guy, but we still need to take them out for our own personal reasons. And if you want to be a part of our friendship, a part of our clique, uh, you need to go and do that. You need to take advantage of them. You need to tear them down. And if you can do that, then you can remain friends with us. You can be a part of this. You might have uh, somebody who's a businessman, and he says to you, hey, you go take out that Samson, I'll pay you money. So it could be for money. It could be to be in a friendship. It could be for money. But here's something else. You might be on the job, and you might have a hardworking, good Samson over there. And you got people higher up saying, if you go over there and you do that person wrong, you sell that person out to us, you do them in, uh, guess what? We might promote you, or we might let you walk around and act like you're somebody that's been promoted. We'll let you walk around and not have to do nothing or not have to do much as if you are one of us. You can pretend to be one of us if you want. If you go and take out that person and show your allegiance to us. Or here's another one. You could be at church and you might have a pastor. And, 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 and you might have somebody that goes to your church or used to go to your church. And that pastor will say, well, okay, I want you to do that person in. I want you to purposely do and say stuff to cause that person trouble, to aggravate them. I want you to do stuff. Listen, to, to get information or pretend to be their friend and get information out of them. And I want you to spy them out and I want you to watch them and I want you to come back and give me that information so I can try to do that Samson in. And now listen, if you want a chance to be on this platform and play this instrument, you better go be a Delilah or a Judas to that person. If you want an opportunity to get up on this stage and preach, you better go be a Delilah or a Judas to that person. If you want to keep having sex with me, you better go and sell out and, and, and be a Judas or Delilah to that person because you know there are a lot of other women in this church that would like to be in your shoes. There's a lot of other women that would like to come mess around with me to have this chance with me. So if you want this, you want to keep sleeping around with me, you got to go sleep around with that Samson and get that information back that I want. If you want special time of me raising you up, and teaching you things and helping you make your way up through the ranks in the church world, you better go over there and be a Judas or a Delilah to that person or else you won't make it and I'll make sure you don't. Whatever it is going on in your life, whatever the situation, whatever the scenario, whatever it is that you're being offered, whether it be money, time, attention, affection, promotion, whatever it is, a chance on the stage, whatever, you can no longer be a Delilah or Judas to people and then try to be a Mary Magdalene at the same time. It will not work. You must pick. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And let me say this last thing, and I'll pray us out of here, and it's this. I greatly believe we are in a time of harvest. In other words, reaping what you've sown. If you've been out here and you've been doing these Samson's wrong, you've been out here using people for your gain, selling people out, trying to blackmail folks, trying to do people in for your own gain. You're not really helping and giving out. You're really taking because the only little bit of help that you are doing is not from the heart. It's just to, to get what you can in the long run. You must understand that you reap what you sow. 
And it is time, I believe, for a time of reaping what we are sowing. And if that's what you've been reaping, guess what you're going to sow? Or that's, if that, that's what you've been sowing, that's what you're going to reap. That's what your harvest is going to be. If you're just out to manipulate people, all you're doing is getting ready to, to bring that type of harvest in, to draw more people to you that are only out to use you the way you're using others. You're just going to draw in more people who will want to use you to be their Delilah. That's all you're doing. All you're doing is you're getting ready to reap all that you've sown and thrown out there. All you're doing is setting yourself up to have more friends, so-called friends, come in your life and act like they're a friend and really they're just ready to backstab you at any moment that someone's going to pay them something. Is that really what you want to reap? Because that's what you've been sowing. And I really hope you think about that. Heavenly Father, I thank you for another time to minister another word. I pray that this would be a message that would be a great wake-up call to the Delilahs out there. You got to choose. And my hope and prayer for you is that you would choose the right thing to be good to the right people and not serve the Philistines, not serve the Egyptians, but serve the people of God, serve the good people, serve the, the, the Davids and serve the Samsons and serve all the Moseses out there. Serve the good people of God if you would serve at all. I thank you, Lord. I give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.